Hello and welcome to Adipec Energy Dialogues. This is a series of conversations brought to you by Adipec where we talk to energy experts and leaders from around the world. And for this session and this episode of Adipec Energy Dialogues, I am absolutely thrilled, I'm honored, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome His Excellency Mohammed Barkindo, the Secretary General of OPEC. Mr. Barkindo, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me, Etna. Thank you very much. You've had a very busy time, and when we look at it, I think we have to just say congratulations to you when we look back on the June meeting, really finding that harmony in the market, that unity in the market. How important was it that you sent this message of strength of OPEC, OPEC Plus, to the market in June? Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, teamwork at its best. And uh, somebody once told me uh, that OPEC is at its best uh, during crisis. I don't know whether that's correct or not, but what we had witnessed uh, on June the 6th, as well as in April, some testimony to that suggestion. We had uh, witnessed uh, the worst month in the history of oil, April. We had also witnessed the worst day in this month, the 20th of April which happened to be somebody's birthday when uh, prices in NYMEX uh, plunged to sub-zero levels for the first time in history and the market was in free fall. It was a perfect meltdown. And we saw how OPEC and our partners in the non-OPEC in the declaration of cooperation rise into the challenge to come up with a historic agreement to withdraw from the market about 9.7 million barrels a day, the largest single uh, supply adjustment in history. Uh, Not to talk of the additional voluntary adjustments by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 1 million barrels a day over and above their commitment within the 9.7 million barrels uh, agreement. Uh, The United Arab Emirates came up with additional 100,000 barrels a day. The state of Kuwait came up with 80,000 barrels a day. The state of Oman came up with 15,000 barrels a day. So there was a a cooperation, collaboration at the highest momentum you can have. In addition to that, Etna, we often forget that uh, these adjustments were coming from higher levels of production that we saw in April. So if you take the net reductions probably from say the Gulf countries, you you will see additional 2.7 million barrels uh, a day. And then we have the countries outside the OPEC plus. For the first time we have uh, a new building block in the architecture of this international cooperation based on the concept and framework of uh, multilateralism with the OPEC plus plus countries joining to show solidarity and commitment to restore stability to the oil market. Uh, We estimate that uh, we will see figures around 3.5 to 3.6 million this year coming from those countries, both voluntary and involuntary. So all in all, in some total, uh, we're likely to see Uh, beyond 17 million barrels a day. And if you factor in our three countries that are under exemption for special circumstances, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, Libya, and Venezuela, again, you are looking at additional 2.9 million. So at the end of it all, we are looking at adjustment of nearly 20 million or so about barrels a day to address this huge and unprecedented imbalance that we have seen. The market facing both a supply shock and a demand shock. Demand shrunk in the month of April in the range of 24 to 26 million barrels a day. Strong focus initially were talking of nearly 30 million. It was unheard of. For the second quarter that we are in now, is still beyond 20 million uh, in terms of uh, contraction. The agreement in April 
and in June, on June the 6th, to extend the first phase beyond May and June to July or historic agreement. And it shows that when countries work together, they can conquer mountains. Now talk to me just about the situation that you have in place. The agreement is in place and it's obviously making the market look a lot healthier, but until the end of July, will this month by month um, and a sort of minute managing of the market, is this absolutely essential the way we have to go until the impact of COVID-19 is cleared really? In view of the sheer magnitude of the demand destruction that we have seen and the supply shock, uh, producing this uh, unprecedented disequilibrium uh, and taking into account the wide scope and broad participation of different countries from different jurisdictions. Uh, there is need for us, uh, as we always say, to keep our hands steady on the steering wheel, if you like. Therefore, it was decided on June the 6th that the monitoring committee, the OPEC and non-OPEC joint ministerial committee should be meeting every month uh, in order to keep the hands on the steering wheel. And this will last up until December. We are cautiously optimistic that the worst is over. However, the fragility and the uncertainties with regards to the recovery, whether it would be a V-shaped recovery, uh, W, U, inverted hockey stick or whatever, the growing consensus is that there will be a recovery in the second half. Uh, the shape and form, we are yet to be certain. So therefore, we thought that it's absolutely necessary for us to keep this monitoring mechanism in place and to meet monthly and report to the conference of OPEC as well as OPEC, non-OPEC ministerial. Indeed, absolutely essential. And of course, when we look at, you know, the effort put in by all producers, I mean, it's, it's a sacrifice for all producers. But when we look at some of the developing countries, you know, it's, it's an even bigger sacrifice for them in many ways too. But it's absolutely essential that we have that compliance. Again, it's difficult for many to do it, but would you say that everybody really has to come on board and we have to see that compliance because it's for the greater good of everybody really? The framework of declaration of cooperation that was uh, put in place in December 2016 was a declaration that comprised of both OPEC and non-OPEC countries, the big and the smaller producers. Uh, it was a holistic framework, a comprehensive framework in which every party uh, has an important role to play. And we have seen this in the last four years. And in the historic agreements that we reached in April and uh, reiterated or revalidated on June the 6th, uh, this was also emphasized that every party to this agreement must strive to fully comply with their supply adjustments. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, we are seeing countries uh, in different regions across the globe uh, uh, doing everything possible uh, within their jurisdictions uh, to comply fully and timely. Now, of course, there's no real way of making sure and that we know when demand is going to come back. But when we look at, you know, OPEC predictions and we look at independent predictions that are out there, when do you anticipate that strength to come back into the market and that demand? We're seeing countries and cities opening up. So there certainly is and there has been over the last few months a bit of an uptick in demand. But when do you think and when do you hope that we're going to see that strength back in the market? Well, the factors that were responsible uh, for this record demand uh, uh, destruction were basically uh, the global lockdown. At the peak of this uh, unholy season, more than half of the population of this world was in one form of lockdown or another. Uh, it goes without saying, therefore, demand for energy, uh, as well as the global economy, would be impacted. And that is what we saw. Uh, we have seen now projections of the global economy 
contracting from a range of 3% to about 6 8% uh, depending on which agency you are looking at as, and the multiplier effect on the demand for energy as well as demand for oil. But as we begin to see countries reopening, for example, here in Europe, in the United States and, and other parts of Asia, you will begin to see demand coming back. We remain optimistic. Uh, as cautious as possible that the worst is over. This recovery uh, will be in full swing in the second half of this year. We are also hopeful that there will be a vaccine for this virus. Uh, we tend to easily, because of the overwhelming effect of this meltdown, easily forget that this is primarily a health crisis, and we are aware that nations across the globe and the scientific and medical community are doing everything they can to find a vaccine. And we are confident that they will. Uh, the issue is the timing, and it goes in tandem with the, uh, the level and the pace of the reopening of societies, communities, and economies. Absolutely. When we look at what's going on, though, at, as you say, these uncertain times, it always makes investors very nervous. And we all know when the price falls a little bit, investors and traders do get nervous in this market. But what is the danger, you know, of the uncertainty that actually might pull investors away from the market at the moment? Because again, we have to look to the long term, because ultimately, like OPEC and all of the producers, we need that stability in the market for the longer future. What's the big danger in terms of fear of investors? And if they don't invest, what could happen in the longer term? Etna is the rule of thumb that investors generally, not only in energy, but in all sectors of economy, are allergic to uncertainties. Investors do not invest in uncertainty. Therefore, when we have this record volatility and the blanket of uncertainty across the entire spectrum, it directly impacts on the appetite of investors. Therefore, what we are facing today is almost unprecedented. Uh, the last time I checked at these numbers, I have seen projections from our side of nearly 20% of contraction in investments in the industry, nearly 1.5 trillion US dollars uh, evaporating uh, across the supply chain. Now, this is understandable because it's not only in our industry. Therefore, the historic agreement to restore stability on a sustainable basis was not only for us, for producing countries, but also for the consuming countries. In the last one month or so, uh, we had met with several major consuming countries in the world. The United States, the European Union here in Europe, China, India, and they all welcomed this historic agreement and they saluted the courage of participating countries to take these unprecedented measures because of the unprecedented times because they know that lack of investment in energy today will be sowing the seed for another energy crisis in the medium to long term, which will not be in the interest of the global economy. Uh, and also, therefore, of course, if I may, yeah. for now, just following on to what you're saying there is, you had, and it was in a tweet too, from the Secretary of Energy in the US, you know, uh, admiring what you had done and supporting what you had done. This is a different uh, turn for the Americans too. But again, very important that they're coming on board here. Yes, we had always been advocates for a comprehensive uh, uh, participation in the energy dialogue, especially during this energy transition. We had tried to break barriers and we even broke bread with the American independence in order to reach out to reach common understanding 
on the role of oil in the global energy transition. Now, for the first time, we have seen the U.S. at the highest levels of government, not only supporting this agreement, but working for the successful implementation of the agreement. Now, this is a turning point uh, in the history of oil. Uh, the global community welcomed this leadership in the White House, as well as in the Kremlin, in the Royal Court in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and many other uh, capitals around the world who came out in full support of our joint efforts with the non-OPEC uh, participating countries. When we look at the transition of energy and we look at what's going to happen in the future and what's, we look at demand for hydrocarbons and we look at demand for other forms of energy. And again, that energy transition is well underway. The environment still has to remain key and it has to remain at, you know, number one when we look at what people have to do. How important is that? And indeed, how will this stand off in terms of the impact of COVID-19? How will that affect the energy transition and the role of the environment? Environment still remains center stage uh, in the energy uh, transition. Uh, the central challenge of how to address carbon emissions uh, using technology uh, is still on the front burner. And this pandemic has further uh, aggravated the agitations, if you like, and the need uh, for the global community to rise in unison and address this issue. Uh, we in OPEC, we continue to work with partners, both in the industrialized uh, countries, in the Annex One countries of the United Nations Framework Convention on uh, Climate Change, uh, to have a holistic approach in which all sources of energy will be required in the medium to long term. And this is not only the view of OPEC, this is the view of the global community. At the moment, there is no one source of energy that can meet the current demand of over 7.5 billion souls in this world, let alone the future demand of uh, the global community. We project that by uh, 2040, there will be additional 1.6 billion people coming into this world. And the issue of energy poverty is still part of the greatest challenge of our time. The challenge of climate change and energy poverty are two sides of the same coin. Therefore, it is only the global community working together, the rich industrialized countries, the poor developing countries, uh, energy producing countries, energy consuming countries, to address this one issue. How do we tackle this twin challenge? And also when we look at inventories around the world, inventories at the moment are very high, and OPEC has always been looking at the five-year average time and time again. But when do you think we're going to see a sense of a rebalance in the market and how important will it be then to get the inventories down? It's been good, I think, for all of the countries to build up their strategic oil reserves. And it's been good for many of the consuming countries, even like countries like India and some of the consuming countries that need to buy at a cheaper price, perhaps, and have it there. But when do we think we're going to see a bit more stability on the rebalancing? Without the historic decisions that we took in April and revalidated in June, on June the 6th. We projected that inventories, stocks around the wall, would have built up by about 1.3 billion barrels. And if you cast your mind back to the last downturn, 2014-2016, we had reached a peak in the summer of 2016 of about 400 million barrels over and above the five-year average, which took us nearly four years with the declaration of cooperation, with the high level of compliance by participating countries to bring down the stock levels to around the five-year average 
and restore balance of supply and demand. Now, thank God, we were proactive. We tried to stay ahead of the curve and we took this decision, the largest ever, the longest ever, and this 1.3 billion will not materialize. However, according to our projections, at the current level of our implementation of the supply adjustment, together with countries outside the OPEC plus, who are also playing their role, uh, we estimate that in the second half of the year, demand will rebound and the stocks would begin to be withdrawn. Uh, we have already started seeing that. And hopefully by the end of the year, we will begin to see some semblance of stability uh, being restored. Then we would be in a position uh, to move into the next phase of how to sustain uh, that stability. And hence, the duration of two years for this agreement to April 2022. And indeed, sustaining that stability is all important. And of course, you have many ministers, great supporters that make sure that that's top of their agenda. And we hear these messages coming from His Excellency Al Mazrui here in the United Arab Emirates as well. Obviously, the UAE, a very key member of the OPEC family, but also your connectivity and your dialogue and your connection with them. You work very close and have been all along too. How important you know, is the UAE as an OPEC member, like, like all of the members, of course, in the family? And you know, what's your message to you know, the industry here in the UAE? Uh, the UAE, as you rightly described, is, is a key member of OPEC. Uh, it has been uh, providing uh, very uh, proactive, uh, very constructive uh, engagements with us, both in OPEC and the OPEC Plus. Uh, the leadership in the Emirates have been providing leadership both at political as well as policy and technical levels, to which we very much appreciate. His Excellency Mohammed Suhail al mazrui the Minister of Energy of the Emirates, has been one of the champions of this agreement. He has always been playing this leadership role throughout uh, the last downturn and with the restoration of stability through the declaration of cooperation, including during his tenure as president of the OPEC conference. And uh, Suhail has continued uh, to uh, display this uh, qualitative uh, leadership role, especially during this crisis, uh, to which OPEC uh, is very much uh, appreciative of. Now, talk to me about OPEC at 60. This is indeed a great year for OPEC. The organization has been growing in strength over the years, and here we are 60 years later. What do you think that the legacy is at this point, if you look back? And you have, of course, been a very vital part of OPEC in your many roles in the commercial sector, working with an NOC and indeed your roles uh, at OPEC over the years too. Looking back over 60 years, I mean, what's your reflection and what are you getting ready for this year when you look at OPEC at 60? Yes, you're quite right, uh, Etna. Uh, we look forward to our diamond anniversary in September of this year. Uh, we have received a generous invitation for OPEC and our partners in the non-OPEC to return back to our roots, uh, where OPEC was founded in September of 1960 in the same venue where the five founding fathers, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, uh, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, and Venezuela sat called the al Shab Hall in the Hybra area of Baghdad called Babul al muadhim to take stock of this marathon that started 60 years ago. When this organization was founded in September of that year, I don't think many gave us any chance of surviving. We had survived in the last six years about six now maybe seven uh, with this uh, pandemic 
oil cycles. And each time we manage to uh, get our act together and navigate successfully uh, through these cycles uh, in the interest of both producers and consumers. We had witnessed wars, invasions, who deters, and what have you within this organization. And yet at every turn, the organization rose to the challenge, came out stronger and more united. We started as five, and now we're about 13. And we have reached out to our non-OPEC partners in 2016, uh, cementing a relationship among 23 or 24 countries, producing countries across regions of the world. And now we have worked together for the past four years. We have developed that bond of a relationship that is very vital in multilateralism. Therefore, this diamond anniversary in Baghdad will give us an opportunity, and indeed the world of oil, an opportunity to take stock of where we came from, how we survived all these cycles and all these challenges, and what do we expect to see this organization focusing on in the next uh, 60 years? Now, I know you're a great believer in the power of communication. And I think when we look over the years, you've built tremendous dialogues, as you said, with the US, with the EU, I mean, really reaching out there. And you personally have you know, had those meetings and you've talked to some of the independent players and you've used your power of persuasion, all of that in place. Talk to me just a little bit about that power of communication where you don't give up, even when the critics might say, this is not going to work, it's all falling apart, and yet you keep at it and you keep bringing people back to the table. And that dialogue and that communication is so important. Tell me just a little bit about that. Why is it so important? In today's world uh, that has emerged almost as a global neighborhood, thanks to communication, thanks to IT, public communication is indispensable in the conduct of governance at state level or corporate organizations or multilateral agencies like OPEC. The ability of organizations and entities to communicate with their constituencies, with the global community is absolutely essential in today's world. The ability to uh, uh, craft, articulate your messages and uh, convey them efficiently and effectively to your target audience is an indispensable art of governance in today's world. Now, OPEC in the last 60 years had always been on the defensive as a cartel, as they fondly refer to us, uh, as an organization that uh, is involved in all sorts of uh, unprintable names. Therefore, the world has changed. Therefore, we also have to change. Uh, we decided to change, to reach out, to articulate our messages, uh, to reach out to our audiences, uh, to break barriers. Uh, and the situation is turning in favor of global cooperation, global multilateralism. We are therefore on the wave, not against the wave. So when we started a couple of years ago through the declaration of cooperation, we reached out not only to producers outside OPEC, but also to independents in the United States, to IOCs, to other national oil companies, and also to consuming countries. OPEC in the last few years has established energy dialogues with the European Union, a major consuming region of the world. We have an ongoing dialogue with China, the second biggest consuming country in the world. We also have thriving energy dialogue with India and also with the United States. Uh, 
uh, we have developed and reached out to the independents who now understand that we all belong to the same boat. There may be independents in the Balkan, in the Permian, but their actions or inactions affect consumers around the globe, as well as producers. They found out that we are not only on the, the same boat, but on the same page on most of these issues. And therefore, there was no need to maintain any barrier be between us. And I can pleasantly report to you that the situation has changed. And we all appreciate the cooperation of all stakeholders to rise to this challenge. We are now looking forward beyond this pandemic, uh, what type of architecture will emerge in order to continue to produce, to, 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 to provide uh, leadership uh, in our industry. And indeed, long may it continue. I think everybody is wishing you well and hoping that you carry on as you have, because I think we're, we're seeing the results of that and we're seeing the results of that tenacity and really making sure that that dialogue is strong and that dialogue continues. Uh, Mr. Barkindo, thank you so much. Um, I know you're very busy. You have many bilaterals. You have many ministers um, on your list to do every day. So we really at ADIPEC, from the ADIPEC Energy Dialogues, we want to really thank you so much for taking this time to share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Etna, for having me. I wish you uh, well. Uh, stay safe with your family and all our friends and colleagues at ADIPEC. See you soon. And of course, to all of our viewers out there, that was His Excellency, Mr. Mohamed Barkindo, the Secretary General of OPEC. So keep an eye on ADIPEC Energy Dialogues for more information about what's impacting you in the oil and gas sector. Again, Mr. Barkindo from OPEC, thank you so much. Bye-bye.